So I just came back from watching Ari Aster's Bo is Afraid, and it's about... It's impressive to see Ari Aster given the creative reign by A24 to let his imagination run wild with the 35 million budget. A lot of people would consider this film to be self-indulgent because I like surrealism. I thought the film was an interesting blend of psychological thriller and absurdist comedy. We're essentially watching a comedy of errors unfold within one week of Bo Wasserman's metaphoric reality, and he's played exceptionally well by Joaquin Phoenix. I think Joaquin Phoenix and Ari Aster are indeed a match made in heaven, and I won't be surprised if they decide to collaborate again in future films. He is really committed to the insanity of this odyssey that Aster has created, and also throws himself into quite a lot of physical stunts. It plays to his strengths of the outrageous comic timing Phoenix demonstrated in Inherent Vice, and of course, someone with some kind of mental instability like in Joker and You Were Never Really There. But despite his depressive anxieties, the film refreshingly abstains from making his character another warning trigger warning suicidal character as phoenix has portrayed in those latter films but like astrid's previous films it continues to explore the relationship with death in case it's through a bizarre hereditary condition Bo suffers which possibly involves dying from orgasm this calls to mind a scene in woody allen's manhattan the premise is this guy screws so great screws so great screws so great that when he brings a woman to orgasm. She's so fulfilled that she dies. And incidentally, this is the first... This and Incidentally, this is the second time Parker Posey and Joaquin Phoenix has made love on screen. As they previously collaborated in Alan's mediocre Irrational Man, and the intercourse scene is certainly one of the most unique love scenes ever put to film. And I've never laughed so hard, but also feels terrified at the same time. And that scene really elicited a really visceral reaction from everyone in the theater. For the three hour runtime, I think the film's rather well paced and for me, it rarely dragged. The first act's actually quite a coherent setup in establishing the heightened reality that's a blend between a post-apocalyptic crime-ridden city and a manifestation of Bo's own insecurities turned up to 11. For instance, when neighbors pound on his door overnight even though he wasn't the one making any noise which leads him oversleeping and missing his flight when he was supposed to go visit his mother losing his suitcase and then his keys and then he suddenly locked out of his apartment building when homeless people vandalize his unit while he's trapped outside while i like seeing a filmmaker pay homage to another filmmaker that i like for instance i think Astor's films are very inflicted by stanley kubrick I sometimes think he tends to borrow his visual motifs as a result of a lack of nerve. What I mean is, I remember being so intrigued by 90% of Hereditary already, so I didn't need Tony Collette to pull a Jack Nicholson from The Shining towards the end. And in Midsommar, he very directly invoked Kubrick with that overhead wide shot of how the tables in the cult are set up, exactly like the hexagonal patterns in the Overlook Hotel. And of course, that disturbing sex scene among the sisterly cult, which clearly feels like an outtake from Eyes Wide Shut. Here, I think Astor is more confident in coming into his own style. If there's one thing Astor has inherited from Kubrick in all his films, it's precision. It's how he controls when the camera should move and when it shouldn't. I also thought the camera was less showy and pretentious because he really trusts the camera to occasionally sit back in static mode and let the performances, the incredibly mind-blowing visuals like the animated sequence, and of course the absurdity of the action unfold all in a wide. He also makes a really interesting use of handheld zooms in a couple of scenes. Obviously, you can argue the inevitable Charlie Kaufman parallels with how the film uses surrealism to question existence and the world we live in, which is more apparent in the third act. And that also leads to a minor problem I had with the finale of this film, which also affirms some of the problems I had with Hereditary. I say this because I'm someone who stands by saying Midsommar is a better film overall than Hereditary. And my frustration with Hereditary is when he established something so intriguing. You know, you've got a great Tony Collette performance, exploration of grief, and then he lacks the audacity to follow that through because 
he resorts to taking bits and pieces from other movies. When the viewer is misled to believe that everything will culminate to some big reveal, and spoilers, turns out not only does it have nothing to do with the miniature house at the start of the film, or to some extent maybe it does, but I thought it was just a ripoff of Rosemary's Baby, and then it resorts to a 10 minute exposition that explains everything preceding it, which for me invoked the end of Hitchcock's cycle, but in a very frustrating way. In comparison, Midsommar's beginning and ending is exceptionally bookended with the opening painting that foreshadows the false happy ending fairy tale Florence Pugh's character is trapped in. You can argue that you can spot the ending a mile away with Christian's final sacrifice, but I thought it really emotionally connected with how Florence Pugh is desperately in need of a family having lost one and she thought she found her sisters within the Swedish cult and that final shot where she smiles is one of the most disturbing yet memorable images that is stuck in my mind. That's not to say I needed questions answered watching Bo is Afraid. I think the unpredictability of its episodic structure scene to scene is what enhances the experience of this film. Every segment is basically an opportunity to cross genres when you go from the parents played by Nathan Lane and Amy Ryan that seems so unnaturally generous after Bo is hit by their truck. It feels like they may be keeping Bo in hostage to process their own grief having lost their own son because he served in the war. Then you have the forest and the meta play within a play, which is really the point when I accept that the journey isn't about trying to connect any dots, but rather a psychological experience. You're talking about a film where there's a sequence where a teenage girl starts drinking paint. When there's some sort of revelation in the attic, again, Asta really loves his attic sequences. You really could not take the Kafka-esque imagery of the absurd creature you see on screen, literally. When Bo finally comes face to face with his mother played by Patti LuPone, who really has a commanding screen presence, and there's a Norman Bates thing going on with Bo's relationship with a seemingly protective mother, it became a little bit too on the nose in how it's the only part of the film where it started to regurgitate some very unresolved mommy issues. It's hinted at one point that every moment in Bo's life is recorded and you can see it like watching a playback or you can fast forward on a remote on TV. I wasn't fully sold in how the film then decides to focus on every moment Bo has disappointed his mother, hum brought humiliation to himself or the broken promises he has made or hasn't made. I wish the film was more committed to the absurdist comedy more in the third act because it started taking itself too seriously. And if it had taken a more satirical angle with the mother, the relationship Bo has with his mother, I would have wanted a full Louis Brunel, like in Phantom of Liberty, where you have characters accepting contradictions of illogical things like gathering around a dinner table while sitting on toilet seats. That's kind of the vibe I wanted. And I thought the finale, while it was interesting, it worked against the episodic structure and genre crossing elements it has established. That said, I'd still check out any film Ari Aster makes, and it's impressive to see a filmmaker working today, an auteur that takes you on a journey and is so audacious in trying to push the norm. I'd rather see a filmmaker swing for the fences than someone who doesn't bother trying. And I'm compelled to see this film again. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, please hit the like button and subscribe to stay up to date with our latest videos.